we will finish what is it, module nine today. Uh, we're talking monopolistic competition, think restaurants here. This is what we were talking about at the end of class the other day. You have a bunch of people doing it, and the products are differentiated. You know, there's a difference between a Five Guys burger and a Brian Steakhouse burger and a Cajuls burger and a McDonald's burger. So there are differences. It's overall relatively easy to do. I ain't saying it's super easy, but I mean, it's pretty easy to open a restaurant. You know, all you need to do, you know, we talked about that, is get an oven, get a thing, you find somebody that knows how to cook, get a few tables and chairs, you can make it happen. You can do a food truck, right? And it's, just, it's not that hard to do. Um, <clears throat> each company is going to have some area, some power in their area, but not, as in, not in the industry over, overall. Your price setter, because your product is different, that gives you some power to change your prices. All in, Pick what price you can charge, but you can't get too carried away. And advertising is usually, usually huge, but generally not non priced advertising. I'm not going around saying we're the cheapest, we're the cheapest food in town. And everybody would go, I wonder why. Cheapest hot dogs in town. I wonder what's in the hot dogs. <laughs> the leftovers of a man in a monkey and a viper. <laughs> Um, for those of y'all following along at home, that was a reference to something we talked about before I started recording. That's why you need to take the class live instead of on the internet. Um, and we finished up overall the difference between monopolistic competition and oligopolies is basically you have more producers and it's easier to do. And then they're generally going to be smaller geographic areas. That's where we finished last week. So, this is coming back to the advertising thing. And a lot of the, these next couple slides, it, it also goes to the monopolistic competition. I mean, but oligopolies and duopolies, do, you mean the idea of brand image. Each company has its own distinct identity. What do you think of when you think of Apple? Uh, I think of, well, let me rephrase it. Think of the iPhone compared to other phones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Right. Like oh, okay. Here it happens. Well, well, Apple makes the right phone occasionally. Okay, so, uh, what do you think of when you think of an Android phone? I mean, Apple phone, an iPhone versus an Android phone? Apple's kind of more like innovative, like new, new stuff. If you think so, okay. It depends. What's but what else? Huh? Secure. Oh, security. Apple values security and privacy a little bit more than Android. What do you think of for Android? They value freedom. You can hack them, you can do whatever, and they're different. You want a phone that's got a screen that big around, you can get an Android phone that literally has like a twin screen thing. That if somebody made one of them, it's like this wide and like yay tall. You can order it from China or whatever. You can like get one of strap and strap to your wrist and that kind of thing. You can, you can for somebody's making a Android tablet that's like 26 inches, it's like the size of a computer monitor. I mean, anyway. So, um, brand image. What do you think of when you think of Honda or Toyota? What? What did you say? Reliable. Reliable. Reliability. What else? Efficient, good value for your money. What do you think of when you think of Mercedes? Luxury. Luxury. Yeah. What do you think of when you think of, I don't know, Kia? Mom car. <laughs> Mom car, okay. Um, I think it's a little hamsters. Oh, it's a little hamsters, okay. Um, what do you think of when you think of a 1973 Pinto? <laughs> Explosions. Yeah. Death trap. Yes. So the um, first word that came to mind was the best of houses. Yes. So, so you had the option of riding in a pinto or getting sewn in a sack with a monkey and a viper. Right. Uh, well, at least you're sewn in the sack and getting where you're going. Like, <laughs> yes. You're getting into the water. So water versus burning. So yes. Uh, but but the, the thoughts that we have about the products and the company is just from a lot of it. Some of it from our personal experience, but then some of it is from what we hear other people say. Some of it is from what we get in the advertising and what they end up telling us. And so each 
product has this identity, this image. So if you're sitting there saying, well, I'm all about quality, you're going to be looking to buy a car. It's going to be like a Mercedes or a Honda or Toyota, maybe. You're going to be looking to buy an iPhone, not some kind of LG phone. You know, you're going to be looking to buy Levi's jeans or something like that, not whatever's hanging out of rack at Walmart. All right. But so, because there should be images that you have based on who you are. You start with what is it that I'm looking for, and then you're going to be trying to find brands that match into what you're looking for. So the companies are going to be big in trying to establish this brand identity. This is who we are. Do you want your food fast? Do you want your food cheap? Do you want your food good? That's going to, those are the three defining characteristics for restaurant. Think, think fast food restaurants. Is it fast also cheap? Hmm? Is it fast also cheap? Oh, uh, I was just, let me write this on here. When it comes to restaurants, you got fast, you have good, you have cheap. You can never have all three of them. You can have one, a restaurant can be one of those, it can be two of those, but it can't be three of those. There ain't no way to be fast and good and also come in cheap. So, if you're going to be running a restaurant, where do you want to be? Fast and good. Depends on what it is you're trying to do. Uh, McDonald's. McDonald's is fast and cheap. Burger King. Not twice as fast. Better than McDonald's. Cheap, kind of fair with cheap. Yes. Uh, Hardee's. Ain't nothing fast about Hardee's, right? Nothing fast about Hardee's. I think you work at Hardee's. Oh, okay. That's good. Yes. It just ain't nothing fast about Hardee's. Is food good? If you if you're willing to wait around, well, by the time you you keep the food started, that you've been there for ten minutes waiting. We probably get a juice. Are you having? Did you go there? I went to one in North Carolina, and they told me I was literally waiting for thirty minutes, and I was like, "What's going on?" And they're like, "This is a sit down restaurant." Since when? Yeah, uh, and you just sort of like my point to the drive through window over there is. Is food good? Probably, if you can ever stand, wait long enough to get it, is it cheap? Yeah. No. So you can be one of these, you can be two of these, you can be three of these. So if you're driving down the road or whatever, you're like, I want some good food. I'm going to move this good food. You ain't going to McDonald's, you're going to go somewhere else. If you're like, I'm riding down the road and you know, I'm in a hurry because I'm, I've already been pulled over by the cops twice and I'm really behind schedule and I still got to eat somewhere, which drive through are you going to go through? McDonald's, right? So the brand image that these restaurants are conveying is getting you in the mind of a quick picture of what the restaurant's about. So then when you're in the mood for that kind of food, you already know where to go. When I watched the original movie, um, they said it was about 30 seconds. Well, it was like, not necessarily. Yeah, no. And they actually, if y'all ever, you know, you go to the drive-thru, you order your food, you pay for it, and then they come back two seconds later. Even though there's no cars behind you, they come up and they ask you to go ahead and pull forward to the door. The reason for that is because you're being timed, and they get in penalized if you're there. It's more than just like 80 seconds, I think, to measure cover. If you're there more than 80 seconds, then they start getting dinged, so they have you drive away, drive up to the door, and they'll bring you food five minutes later. Whenever they do it, they just try but, you know, the goal is everybody's supposed to get their food in 80 seconds. Right. Well, this is the movie you said 35 seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, that was then. This is now. That's right. But then, ooh, but think about, okay, you place your order and they get you your food in 30 seconds. Uh, how fresh is that food? Did they cook that hamburger fresh to order? No, that hours, circuit's been hours. sitting under a heat lamp for a while. Them chicken nuggets sitting under a heat lamp for a while. Those french fries sitting under a heat lamp for a while. So, fast, in order to get into 30 seconds, where the rubbery is coming to mind, right? So, you can eat food fast and cheaper at the same time. But, <coughs> we as customers think differently about the products, even as far as they can be good, fast, and cheap. 
some of y'all might just define me. You say, I say, you know, Burger King, like, I say, good. I said, better than McDonald's. Some of y'all are probably like me. But of course, granted, it depends on what Burger King go to up there. Some of them the like, but if the way we as customers think about the products, it may end up being different from company to company. But ideally, the company is going to get everybody thinking about the company basically the same way. When we're talking iPhones, does the word quality come to mind? Yeah, as much as I hate them, those things are fairly well built. Except for the screens. Except for the screens, well, that will put them in your back pocket and everybody wins. But just, and I've replaced way too many iPhone screens. So, okay. But never held an iPhone, but yet I've replaced the pickup screens. Compare those fucking screws in whatever. Oh, yeah, they're stupid little, yes. Anyway, I digress. Um, but the but you know it's like you know, Apple was the first one to come up with the aluminum unibody design thing. So your phone isn't supposed to bend. For most of the rest, if you take your Android phone or whatever, you can set it on a counter here, and you can just fly rocket back and forth across this way or this way. It's going to have a little bit of a flex to it. But you know, Apple, aluminum. The y'all's MacBooks, aluminum, right? Not plastic. You know, plastic. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, but you know, Apple, you know, most people, you know, love them or hate them, you're cool. Maybe y'all knew that Apple's privacy focus, maybe you didn't know that Apple's privacy focus, but everybody agrees that, that Apple stuff is very well built. iPhones, they have their quirks, but they never really ended up exploding like the Note 7 did. Yeah, Note 7, yeah, yeah, I have one too. Uh, yes, oh, congratulations. Um, Oh, and for the record, the, the, the wireless rechargeable Apple earbuds that they were talking about that they canceled the other day. It was the, the big charge. It kind of really had like a big charge that you could buy everything. Yeah. The watch, the phone, the iPad. But they just stopped getting it. Yeah. The, the problem is, is because they're trying to get thin, so that battery is going to be dense. And the denser the battery, the easier you go. And that's what happened in the notes out there. So that's why Samsung's not been in any hurry to make their phones super, super, super thin for the next year or two because they're not trying to cram as many molecules in such a small area to cause heat. What? So, the things I know. I know battery technology and sewing somebody in a bag with a chicken with a cat. Um, you messed up. Uh, but, <clears throat> But the idea of getting the brand image is getting people to think about your company in a certain way. Because then once you get them thinking about your company in a certain way, the next thing is to get them loyal to your company. Because if thinking is thinking, when you think fast food, you think about them. And then, so they become fast food to you, then every time you're thinking, I need fast food, you go to them. And they're creating, I mentioned that earlier, oh, okay. oh, I, I mentioned it earlier, they're trying to create an artificial monopoly in your mind. They're trying to get you, change the definitions of words in your mind, is what they, ultimately what they're trying to do here. Um, fast, maybe not it, but, um, Brothers Pizza in Blackstone. I actually one of my online students talking about Brothers Pizza. I was reading about them yesterday, and I'm like, had to come to my class last year Thursday. I'm like, apparently, I need to go to Blackstone because he's talking about how good Brothers Pizza is. So, you know, people in Blackstone are like, Brothers Pizza is it. A whole lot better than Papa John's, a whole lot better than that cardboard they call Domino's. It's better than Pizza Hut, and actually the dude, whoever was said it, it was better than Pizza Hut. I won't go to Pizza Hut. Well, at least the one of Black Stone. Yeah, Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. So, to, to, especially this guy that I can't remember his name, he was like, he's purposely slagging down Pizza Hut. He was talking about Brothers Pizza. So, for him, he likes quality pizza. Not cardboard. If he wants cardboard, he'll get Gidalos. But if he, otherwise, if he wants pizza, I'll have to tell you all about another pizza place. Uh, he wants Brother's Pizza. So to him, Brother's Pizza is pizza. So then whenever he starts thinking, I'm hungry for pizza, he just picks up the phone and calls Brother's number because there is no question of, I'm hungry for pizza. I wonder which pizza place I'm going to order from today. No. 
grain loyalty. I talked about that the other day. Yellow soda to me is sun drop. If I'm in the mood for yellow soda, and I am, I'm going to a sun drop. There ain't no question. For some of y'all, I don't know what is your soda of choice, what is your beer of choice, what is your snack of choice. Just some of you, yeah. I, I, I'm in the mood for chocolate. Peanut you know, M&Ms is what you get because that is chocolate to you. And that's what they're trying to establish in your mind and keep that loyalty. Every time you think pizza, you call the brothers without even thinking about it. They remove that step from your thought process. Brothers pizza is pizza to you. So they can do that by making the products different because brothers pizza is different. If brothers pizza tasted and looked and smelled exactly the same as Papa John's and Domino's and Pizza Hut, then who are you gonna get your pizza from? Whoever's the cheapest, whoever's the closest. All right. So then they got to charge the same price, whatever, suddenly you back into fewer competition category again. But the fact that they're different, they can try to milk those differences to change definitions in your mind. But that's how they get brand loyalty. And when they have that loyalty, then it gives them control over the price that they can charge you because you're locked in. Those of y'all that have been using iPhones for the last six years, you're kind of locked in. You're going to be rolling up there, and you're going to be, it's going to be tough splitting for you to give up the iPhone and switch over to Samsung. Because you're giving up, well, I know how to use iTunes. I know how to do this stuff. I've got all this money I spent on games and the in-app purchases and all this kind of stuff. And all that stuff is going to go away. And it's a form of getting brand loyalty out of um, For me, how how uh, we've talked about it, how high is Suntrop have to raise their prices before I start drinking Mountain Dew. We don't know yet. We don't know yet, and we're trying not to figure that one out. Which occasionally I'll drink more that Mountain Dew soda bread. Uh, we drank that occasionally. So. Did they make that? Anymore? Okay, I actually haven't had it in a while. Try to pop up a lot. Okay. Have you ever had the red Sundrop? Yes. Once. Okay. Not a fan. That's a thing. Yeah, it's it's, not, uh, it's like cherry yeah. thumb drop. So, because this is already ooh, lemon, whatever, citrusy, whatever, then you put the cherry in there, whatever. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. Cherry stuff like uh, uh, cheer wine. I like me good cheer wine. I like me good thumb drop. I don't want the two mixed together. And that's the, the kind of the direction of that I was going. It's like I love me a hamburger. I love me, love me Krispy Kreme donut. But when you go to the state fair and they make the hamburger with a bun, your, your hamburger is in between two Krispy Kreme donuts. That's not good uh, because I don't know things like lettuce, tomato, and mayonnaise do not belong anywhere near Krispy Kreme donuts. It's just that's like I don't know beer and chocolate. No, they don't go together. Some things just don't mix together. Uh, you don't with perfection. <laughs> no. Anyway. Okay. Um. All right. So, uh, <coughs> brand loyalty gives you control over the price. My daddy drove a Chevy, his daddy drove a Chevy, his daddy drove a Chevy. We've all been driving Chevy. It's on my life, so where am I going to do it by a Chevy? Or, 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 or am I going to go to my car? I'm going to Chevy dealership. And what am I going to do if I go up there on the price of Chevy is expensive? Maybe I'm going to go to the Ford dealership and then I'm going to get caught going to the next family reunion, riding up in the Ford and park my Ford next to all the Chevys that are there in the driveway. And my daddy, granddaddy, and great granddaddy all coming out mocking me, making fun of me, slashing my tires, and just only me. Writing me out of their will and all that kind of stuff. Crap. I'm going to buy a Chevy too. Crap. Or a Chevy. Okay. So, <coughs> so, I mean, so that brand loyalty, it is a thing, and it gives the companies power over the customer. So, ultimately, each firm, you only have the monopoly on your own brand image. You create that image, you, you create that message, you get that message out, and you get people to buy into that message, and those are the only people you have control over. Brothers Pizza only has control over the people that really like Brothers Pizza to the point where they say no other pizza in Blackstone will do if I'm in Blackstone and I'm eating Brothers Pizza. People who know that. People who know about it. Well, apparently I know about it, but have I ever eaten a Brothers Pizza? No. Am I going to anytime soon? Probably not. 
maybe if I go to the Virginia Tech Extension thing sometime to visit or something like that, I might end up going there for lunch if I ever get there. Research is only but I don't know that that's gonna happen because I've been here for what 15 years I think maybe. <clears throat> but that's the only thing that they have control over. So they want that they're ultimately trying to create a monopoly and get as many people sucked into it as they can. Ultimately, that brand loyalty makes the demand curve less price elastic. Makes it to where they change their price, your sales aren't going to go anywhere. They raise their price, they're not going to lose that many sales. They lower their price, well, unfortunately, they may not gain a whole, a whole lot of sales. But it gives them the opportunity to raise their price. So, for your restaurants, for whoever, ultimately, their production decision is the exact same as everybody else. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. They keep producing, keep producing, keep producing, as long as they're making any money more to produce the item than it costs them to make it, until it gets to the point where if I make this next one, I'm going to break even, then there ain't no point. So guess what? Every producer has this same rule. Pure competition had it, monopolies had it. Monopolistic competition had it, oligopolies, duopolies have it. The only difference, so they all have the role. The only difference is you have any control over what your marginal revenue, namely your price. You have any control over that, which monopolies do. To a certain extent, our monopolistic competitions do. And then what kind of control do you have over your costs? And can you do anything about your costs? Your oligopolies have a chance to do something about their costs, increasing their production, that kind of stuff. Monopolies, they certainly have influence over their costs. But pure competition, can't really do anything about that, can't really do anything about that, so it is what it is, right? Our farmers, it is what it is. So, Since it's easy to do, we're coming back to that. Uh, we beat this debt, beat this horse to death. If companies in the industry are making a profit, people are going to say, Ooh, break me off a piece of that. If you are riding through town and you see a bunch of restaurant owners that are all riding around in fancy cars and air, living in big houses and that kind of stuff, people are going to say, Well, they're making a bunch of money running restaurants. It ain't hard for me to run a restaurant. I think I'm going to do that too. Because there's money to be made, right? So as long, since it's relatively easy to do, as long as there's profit being made, beyond that economic profit, companies are going to be coming in. Um, and whenever they come in, the market supply curve is going to shift to the right. The demand for each individual company shifts to the left. Think about that. Sorry, <coughs> uh, South Hill, there's 30, well, let's just say there's 30 restaurants in South Hill. Kind of right that Anybody want to run a restaurant? Say, look, uh, run one. Uh, uh, Lovely, and she's not here today, but she's in the in my part of finance class, and she's doing an honor project. She's doing something about running a restaurant. So say she's going to open up her city food restaurant. So we go from having 30 restaurants in town to 31 restaurants in town, right? So what ends up happening? The supply is increased because we'll get, there should be more tables. There should be 31 dining rooms instead of 30. 31 sets of tables and chairs instead of 30. 31 ovens instead of 30, right? So the supply is going to increase. But for Pinot's, What's happening to them, their demand as a result is going to come back. Because we went from 30 restaurants to 31 restaurants, so you kind of figure that, so we had a 3% increase in restaurants. So that probably means that each restaurant in the state is going to end up with 3% less customers, right? Because we have 130 more options to go to. 
So those people that, well, you know, if I if I eat the restaurants, I go in alphabetical order. I start eating at the ones that begin with letter A, and I eat all the way through until I get to the one that begins with letter C, and then I go back to the A again. So I'm eating, you know, so I eat at each restaurant one day a month. Now it's each restaurant a little over once a month, right? So what ends up happening in that case? Prices go lower because they're getting pushed down both ways because <coughs> We've got to lower, so the restaurants are a little bit like, yeah, I know there's just a restaurant in town, but maybe we got to lower our price in order to keep from losing so many customers. Profit is going to get squeezed out because we're going to have 3% fewer customers and our prices are going down. So how do you feel if you're running a restaurant and then Lovely opens up a restaurant in town? Are you going to go up to her? Welcome to the brotherhood. Welcome to the fraternity. Welcome to the sisterhood. What? No. You're going to be over there grumbling, dang it, I can't believe it, barely making profit anyway, now I just lost 3% of my cookies. Right? Just like what we had with corn farmers or whatever, where the businesses are not having when a new competitor comes into business. Well, how do we think about it as customers? Great. Woo-hoo, right? Because there's more food to choose from and prices are going to be getting lower, if anything. So what's going to end up happening is you can end up getting a situation where this is going to keep happening. New businesses are going to keep coming in until the amount of profit goes back to that zero economic profit number that we were looking at for our agriculture. Remember that? But for pure competition, ultimately you got whittled away some farms from making money, some farms are losing money, but basically it ends up being a great movement overall. That's what you get here. It's going to keep whittling down until everybody's like, those that are remaining are going to be making wages plus a normal profit, and that's it. Which is why if, when you do ride around town and you drive by it past the house of the person that's running a restaurant, they driving around fancy cars. Are they living in huge, big, huge mountain? No. They live in huge houses, they ain't driving around in fancy cars because they're not making much more money doing running the restaurant than they would have been working somewhere else. They're making a little bit more than their wages, but just sort of a normal profit beyond that, and that's pretty much it. So suddenly, this is was exciting, isn't it? Uh, the more profitable companies are going to be which? More efficient. Personally, those that are more efficient. That, that will help them survive. <coughs> but the people, they can buck this. Because you have that brand loyalty. You have that brand image. You have that thing that we're different. We're not just like all the other pizza places in town. Yeah, all those other pizza places are competing with one another to be the cheapest in town because they're all the we're different. We're not fast food and deliver, get it to your house in under four minutes through the next one. That's not us. We have atmosphere. We have tablecloths on our tables. Yeah. We actually use fresh ingredients. We actually have ingredients besides just cheese and pepperoni. All right? So if you can establish yourself as being different, then you're not in this game. You're playing a different game. And that's what Apple tries to do. <clears throat> Apple, they're walking a weird little tightrope here. Is, is an iPhone a smartphone? Yeah. yeah. Is a Samsung a smartphone? Yeah. Is a uh, Pixel a smartphone? In case you didn't know, I'm in the Pixel. Yes. So if Apple is in this game, it's different. But what does Apple try to tell you? We're different. There is the market for iPhones, and then there's a market for Android phones. And it's different. We're not related to them. We're not connected to them. Don't be thinking of us and them at the same time. Nobody should, in their right mind, be walking into the cell phone store and start scratching their chin going, hmm, do I want the Samsung or do I want the iPhone? It's two different things. What their their message, what they're trying to get out there, if somebody's sitting there saying, do I want the Samsung versus do I want the iPhone, is as absurd as somebody saying, do I want the Samsung or do I want a hot dog? 
two different things. If they can convince you that they are entirely different in this entirely different category, we're not competing with them. We're not like them. Yeah, for desktop, for laptop computers, whatever. Apple is only like 12% of the U.S. market for computers. But no, no we're different. You've got the Apple market, and then you got the Windows market. We're different. They're just operating systems. Yeah, it's the operating system and then the hardware, whatever. It's like you know, different software, different whole thing. We're different. So, yeah, our prices are different because we're different. Just like there's a difference between the price of a hot dog and the price of a cell phone, right? There's a difference between the price of an Apple computer to a Windows computer. That's your thing. They're saying, we're not in this pool. We're over here playing this game. Samsung and LG go forward over here. We're in a whole different ballgame. Y'all are all over there playing basketball. We're over here playing football. In the next field over. But of course. That, uh, said Apple's walking a tiger over there. <coughs> thing is, is Apple has kind of done a pretty darn good job of saying we're different. We're alone. And if you're alone, you what? A monopoly. So then if you're a monopoly, the government's gonna come looking at you. And how is Apple being a monopoly beneficial to society? It isn't. So the government, if the government decides Apple is a monopoly, the government is going to break Apple up. The government, people are complaining, well, the only way I can get my app on an iPhone, I'm an app developer, the only way I can get my app on an iPhone is I have to go to the Apple store, the iTunes store, whatever, App Store, whatever. whatever. Have to go through there, and then Apple gets 30% of my money right off of the bat. Even if it's all the in-app purchases, they get a cut of it. At Apple, all they do is they just host a couple links and you get 30% of my money. Netflix really kicked back on that one a couple of months ago. Because Netflix, the only way you can pay your Netflix subscription, whatever, do that right now to an iPhone, is you had to do it through the Apple Store. So that month after month after month after month, you're paying your $11, $12 to Netflix, for those of you who did it that way, instead of going to www.netflix.com and setting up your account, Apple just got $3 out of Netflix's money for every one of you that, and Netflix, like, that's a bunch of crap. But guess what? So, it, so they had to raise the price, among other things, but then but there's no other option. The only other way they can get people to be using Netflix on an iPhone is if the people will actually I don't know, go get a computer somewhere and log into Netflix and create your account that way and put in your credit card info that way and that kind of stuff and then be just focused. But there is an interesting amount of the planet that their cell phone is the only computer that they have. Is that any of you? I'm finding in the last year or two, it's, an it's getting to be an interesting percentage of my online students that are trying to either work or something on a phone. Kill them. But okay. More power to but so Apple, they're kind of in this weird way. They want in the customer's minds thing for us to think they're monopoly. It's them or only them, and it's our ball game. You can't leave our ball game because you know your football helmet and that kind of stuff won't help leave you playing basketball, right? You just step back to that metaphor. Let's go call back. But they ultimately they say they tell Congress, they tell the government. Well, if people don't like what they are dealing with the uh, iPhone, they can get an Android phone. They admit to the government that an Android phone is your competition to an iPhone. They admit to the government that a Windows computer is a competition to an iPhone, but they're not going to ever admit that to the customer. Because they want you to, what is Apple's slogan? Think different. Right? They want you to think differently about Apple than you do Samsung. So they're in this weird little spot. But that's the only way. So uh, Apple does like 50% of the smartphone sales in the United States. Apple is getting like 90% of the profit for smartphone sales in the United States because they're able to charge a higher price because we're different. And people buy into that difference, buy into that. It's Apple. It just works. Y'all remember that slogan from a couple of years ago? It just works. 
You get an Android phone, good luck with it. You get a Windows computer, blue screen, good luck with it. Apple, it just works. And it got people to buy into that. And so you end up paying more. But so for every company like Apple that's making money, you got people losing the race to the bottom in defeating frenzy like HTC and LG and them all. The, this might be the last year that HTC is going to be making both. Since there you go. So if you can pull yourself out of the water, okay. Otherwise, everybody that's left swimming in this pool is going to generate down to a overall no economic profit situation. So, here. The Samsung's bigger than the screen. Yeah. I got appreciated the same punch for Go for it. Okay. <coughs> I have like 10 minutes on the cell phone and you record there. Um, <coughs> monopolistic competition industries are less efficient than your competition. Restaurant owners are less efficient than farmers. Because restaurant owners, because the industry have what we call excess, what's your excess mean? Extra, excess capacity. What's capacity? Storage or something like that. In this case, think about a restaurant. Hey, Brothers Pizza, how many tables and chairs? How many tables would you say in there? Probably like 15. Okay, let's call it 20, 20 tables. Uh, at 2 o'clock this afternoon, how many of those tables do you think are going to have anybody sitting there? Zero. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. Who's be eating pizza at 2 o'clock on the Tuesday? But the lights on? Yeah. yeah. Is the oven running? Yeah. Is there a waiter, waitress type person in the building? Yeah. The problem is the restaurants, they base their size of their restaurant not on their average how many customers are coming in. They base the size of their dining room based on well, how many customers do we think we can work through here on a Friday night, date night, or Sunday lunch to have those high traffic areas. Because if brothers was to sit there and do the math, okay, during the course of the day, we end up serving 150 people. Over the course of the day, and we open at 10 o'clock in the morning and we close at 10 o'clock at night, so 150 people divided by 12 hours, that works out to 30 people an hour. So 30 people an hour, and we've got tables that seat four people, so 40, and we only need, what, what second be six tables? So, we only need seven tables, but we've got 20. But how many of y'all are comfortable if you come in and grab their speech alone and you just sit down at the table with three complete strangers? All right. Yeah. It, it don't work this way. They have the 30 tables or whatever, 20 tables or whatever it is they have, so they can get more customers in during the busy time, but they're not going to sit there and average it out because otherwise a lot of restaurants are going to find themselves only needing a couple of tables and five chairs. Because, yeah, they may have 50 people in there at 6 o'clock at night, but they've got two people in there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Average it out. Restaurants can't do it that way, right? Think about this college. They didn't come in here and say, ooh, there's a dozen people in the econ class. Let's get the extra desks out of here moving down the hallway, right? No. We don't do it that way. So we are not as efficient as we could be. If we were as efficient as we could be, well, once they see that this class is kind of small and they'll find another class is kind of small, we'll put a little divider in the middle of the room and we'll separate y'all. And I'm going to be on one side of the room, Dr. Hayes is going to be on the other side of the room, and he's going to be figuring out a cube to not play with. All right. I was walking past the door right there, and he just had the door popped open. And I'm like, he's like a lot quieter than I am. Uh, I like more power to him, but I just, oh well. I'm trying to make sure nobody sleeps in my class. He does hypnotism thing, so he puts his people to sleep. So, what's ABC? 
I'll have a show a couple of times. <coughs> have any of y'all taken one of Dr. Hayes' classes? Did he do the hypnotism thing, y'all? No. Okay. Like the college stopped. He made him stop doing that because one girl, when he did the hypnotism, she didn't want to come back. Okay. Because she liked him. And she didn't want to come back. We do these professional development things where we do some training, whatever workshops, and that kind of stuff at the end of the semester, beginning of the semester. And he's done that a couple of times to faculty and staff people and hypnotize them. I'm like, oh, heck no. Because, A, I don't know if he can do it to me. Because I'm just that paranoid of enough, or I don't know that I would be able to relax enough to be in a crowded room to, if I could, I don't know that I would let myself go. But then if I could, and then I don't know they turn you know, you walk around and cluck like a chicken and all that. Uh, yeah. And he told us about that. I'm gonna cluck like a chicken because I want to cluck like a chicken, and I'm okay with clucking like a chicken. Don't give credit, but that's just but I want to do it on my terms, not because Dr. Hayes told me. Or he, said, but he said that's not how it works. Yeah. Oh, I know. I'm just yeah. <coughs> so ultimately, the monopolistic monopolistically competitive firm is going to always have its price above its marginal cost. <coughs> it's probably more efficient. It's having less efficient, excuse me. Less efficient. Think about a restaurant. What's ended up happening to marginal cost? Okay, we I'm a, you go to a restaurant and they're going to you, you order your food and you, you ask for a side, of, a side of corn or a side of beans, green beans or something like that. What do they do? You know, they got it in a hot plate, they scoop a spoon in there, right? Stick to it. And they, all they did is open up that little three can, three five pound can of beans and they dump it in there and they maybe put a little salt in there and then they heat it up in this. How much does it cost them per thing, bowl of beans? You get what, five, ten cents worth of beans in there, and they charge you a dollar for it and all. But did it really cost them five cents for another order of beans? Because maybe they dumped the entire five gallon can of beans in there and then they only ended up selling like 12 servings. And what happens to the rest of their beans? They got to get thrown out at the end of the day, kind of thing, because if they're serving reheated beans and they're three days old and that kind of stuff, um, that's getting back to good, fast, and cheap. We're not on the good end of the spectrum, right? In the end of the spectrum there. So things are just inherited, inherently going to be inefficient. The number of chairs we have, the number of tables we have, the amount of food that's getting cooked, all of it is going to be off. So. Any questions about that? <coughs> 